Welcome back to the Neuroscience Meets Social and Emotional Learning Podcast for episode number 163. With Dr. Dan Hill, an internationally recognized expert on the role of emotions in politics, business, sports, and pop culture, who has spoken to audiences in over 25 countries. There are two currencies in life, he says. There's dollars and emotions. For over 20 years now, Dan has specialized in the latter, often in terms of business applications and often by analyzing facial expressions because he asserts the most valuable 25 square inches of visual territory on earth runs from the eyebrows to the mouth. There, people best reveal and communicate the effective responses that so often drive their behavior, whether in the marketplace, the workplace, their personal lives, or in the realm like politics and sports. If you want to be more successful in life, happier in your marriage, be an expert at handling your kids, a better manager at work, a more effective coach in sports, a better hiring manager, close more sales or negotiate a better deal for yourself, an understanding of how to read someone else's facial expressions is imperative. To capture and quantify emotions, Dan pioneered the use of facial coding, the analysis of facial expressions in market research, and he started doing this in 1998 with his company Sensory Logic Inc. And he's done work for over half the world's top 100 consumer oriented business to consumer companies. Dan has received seven US patents related to facial coding and is also a fax practitioner, which is a popular course offered by someone I've studied in depth, Paul Ekman, who's a well-known psychologist and co-discoverer of microexpressions. Dr. Ekman was named one of the top 100 most influential people in the world by Time Magazine, and he's worked with many government agencies, domestic and abroad, and compiled over 50 years of his research to create comprehensive training tools that read the hidden emotions of those around you. And he believes that we can all improve our ability to do this with training. And Dan Hill has this training. I'm Andrea Samadhi, author and educator from Toronto, Canada, now in Arizona. And like many of our listeners have been fascinated with learning and understanding the science behind high performance strategies that we can use to improve our productivity in our schools, our sports and workplace environments. My vision is to bring the experts to you, share their books, resources, and ideas to help you to implement their proven strategies, whether you're a teacher working in the classroom, a student, or parent working in the corporate space. Our guest for this week's podcast, Dan Hill, whose latest books consist of Famous Faces Decoded, A Guide for Reading Others, Two Cheers for Democracy, How Emotions Drive Leadership Style, and first blush people's intuitive reactions to famous art will help us to take a deep dive into understanding why we need to be able to read the emotions in others he has some earlier business books that include about face the secrets of emotionally effective advertising and emotionomics leveraging emotion for business success which features a foreword by sam simon the co-creator of the simpsons He has a new book that was just released on Amazon yesterday, Blah Blah Blah, A Snarky Guide to Office Lingo, that is a humorous take on how the workplace really operates and the fact that there's a little truth in every joke. Dan Hill is also the host of the EQ Spotlight podcast, where he has discussions with thought leaders about the importance of emotions in politics, culture, and life. In 2014, Dan received front page coverage in the New York Times for his work with professional and NCAA Division I sports teams. Other media coverage has ranged from TV appearances on ABC's Good Morning America, Bloomberg TV, CNBC, CNN, C-SPAN, ESPN, Fox, The Today Show, PBS, and so many others that I'll link in the show notes. 
I'm so very grateful for the fact that this podcast allows me to learn from some of the top leaders in the world on improving productivity and results. Sometimes while preparing for interviews, I step back and just notice how lucky I am to be able to speak directly with those world leaders that I have the chance to learn from and then share their knowledge with you. As I'm researching and meeting new people, you had better believe I'm also applying what I'm learning to my own life. This way is like we're all learning together and I'll never take this learning opportunity for granted. I met Dan Hill through Twitter where he reached out to me sharing his work and as I read his bio, I knew immediately that I had to have him on the podcast to share his work with facial coding to help us to all understand how to read the emotions of others in our schools, our sports environments and workplaces. This is a valuable skill that Dr. Paul Ekman believes we can all develop to help us to deal with what's important in our life without having to take the time to think about it. With practice, we should all be able to use this skill to just know the best way to proceed. Let's meet Dan Hill and learn more about facial coding, what it is, and how we can use it in our own lives. Welcome, Dan Hill. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Oh, delighted to be here. Thank you, Andrea. Well, Dan, I have so many questions for you, but I have to say that when we first met on Twitter, I recognized immediately that we needed to speak. And it was kind of a mix between the fact that I've been studying Dr. Ekman's work on understanding emotions and the fact that you've been applying this for the past 20 years with so many different sectors. I am so excited to learn more on this topic. Wonderful. Yeah, no, it's it's a fascinating journey. I, I have in 20 years never gotten tired of exploring emotions and certainly human nature, which is endlessly confounding in its way. It sure is. Well, my first question for you in your bio, it mentions that you got a front page coverage in the New York Times for your work with professional and NCAA Division One sports teams. And I had to look that up. And <laughs> so then I found this article, what expressions can say about a player. And I wonder how did you use this skill to analyze sports players to profile a successful versus a problem or a non coachable player? Sure. Well, I think that, excuse me, the real headline probably was that I had done work with the NBA team, the Milwaukee Bucks, who just won the championship uh, this past spring. And it was on the draft choice. And that year they had the number two overall pick. And that's certainly something you don't want to squander. So the question was, when I was invited in, was the, uh, met with the general manager and so forth. And then they sat me down with someone and they had short videos from the leading candidates they would consider. So I think there was roughly about a dozen of them. And I had typically about, I'd say, 10 to 20 minutes of video per person. Uh, sometimes it was interviews they had done in the Milwaukee Bucks facility. Sometimes it was stuff they had just you know, snatched off social media and so forth. And so my request or my calling was to go through these and try to get some sense of the player they were considering and whether my belief was that they should go with someone or not. Probably the most important thing they were looking for was someone who would be, I guess you'd have to say emotionally stable, someone who wouldn't flame out, someone who wouldn't, once they get all the money of being a top NBA draft pick, wouldn't like go crazy and devolve into an active drug life and, you know, be on the headlines in a way that really disgraced the town, disgraced the comp the uh, team and, and really failed to, you know, help them, you know, move forward as an NBA team. So of those, there was someone who was the presumptive favorite, in fact, taken number one in the draft. I said, don't worry about it. Uh, that was Andrew Wiggins, who eventually went to the Minnesota Timberwolves instead. And I said, you know, Andrew will do OK, but he doesn't have what I would call broad shoulders. I just got a sense from the guy that he really wasn't going to be someone who carried teammates, who stepped up in the crunch time. Uh, there was just something a little bit furtive about him. There was a little bit of anxiety. I just didn't see him as their guy. And in fact, the one that I suggested to him, I don't remember his first name, but his last name was Parker. He got injured partway through the season, but he was in route to being the NBA Rookie of the Year. So Wiggins got traded by the, by the Timberwolves, went off to a different career. Uh, the guy I suggested would have been Rookie of the Year if he had not been injured. 
Uh, he had another subsequent more serious injury. I think he may not even be in the NBA anymore. Uh, those are things I couldn't possibly predict from watching a little bit of video. Uh, but in terms of those top two, uh, I definitely believe that I chose correctly for them. So now, can you share your secrets of what you're looking for? Are you looking for what do you see and feel between from their eyes to their mouth? What, where are you looking and what are you looking for? Sure. Well, we're going to be getting into facial coding. And facial coding means that there are 44 sets of muscles in the face. And you are looking based on Dr. Paul Ekman's system known as FACTS, Facial Action Coding System. You're looking at 23 expressions that correspond to any of these seven emotions. And those are happiness and surprise, but also anger and fear and sadness and disgust and contempt. So of those seven, I have in my time, both just looking at personalities, including presidential candidates, my work is in consumer research. Uh, I've come to a sense of which of these in a sports setting uh, where you really have to step up would make some sense. Uh, I do look for a degree of happiness because, uh, and a smile is pretty obvious to pick up for any of us, but I'm looking for someone who's coachable, uh, who will take advice, who is open. Happiness as an emotion tends to suggest that I will get, I will brainstorm, I will get to superior solutions, I will do it more quickly, I'm willing to embrace others and be embraced by them. Uh, that's important for a city that at that time was starved for a championship, uh, wanted a player who was coachable, a player who wouldn't be standoffish and would connect with the others there. Uh, they're a small market team. They wanted to think of themselves as a large, small town. So someone who had a sense of community, essentially. Uh, the next thing I actually look for is degree of anger, not like crazy anger. Uh, like I'm going to you know, punch my teammates, uh, get thrown out of the game by the ref, uh, you know, have a police blotter, you know, all those sorts of problems. But you want some degree of anger because anger also suggests that you have drive, that you want to control your own destiny, that you want to make progress. Uh, just go to a very famous basketball player. Michael Jordan would show anger for instance. Uh, the lips might purse together, the eyebrows lower. You have someone who's focusing and determined. And, and so you want that within reasonable measure. Uh, I'm also potentially interested in contempt because contempt is a very complicated emotion. We'll probably go into it more later. But in a lot of instances, what I found in athletes is it's a fine line. Uh, the right amount of contempt, depending on the other emotions involved, can suggest a little bit of swagger and confidence. It can, on the other hand, suggest that you think you're above others. So that's going to be a, a black mark against the notion of being a good teammate and taking advice from the coaches. Uh, so it's a tricky one. I've also found in my work in sports that disgust, which is things like the nose wrinkling, the upper lip flaring like it's bad taste, bad smell. Those sorts of things seem to correlate pretty well in my data with someone who's got a drive to succeed. Uh, it's almost as if mediocrity, mediocrity for them uh, disgusts them, you know, repulses them. It doesn't taste good to them. Uh, they don't, it's too bland. Uh, they want to get to another level. So I've seen a good correlation there, which also pertains reasonably well to CEOs uh, who are successful. Um, so that one is interesting to me. The other one that's worrisome, though, is sadness. Uh, I have seen an inverse correlation between success and sadness involving sports which makes sense because sadness is actually a very helpful emotion in a lot of ways, including for empathy, but it also can tend to make you slow down both physically and mentally as if you're pondering a mistake and nature is saying, don't rush into the next mistake. But on a basketball court with all those feet to cover uh, and needing to move fast, um, I would say it's generally a liability. So all of the things I was looking for, uh, you know, I've left out fear. Obviously, that's important to me. Uh, sometimes fear can be motivating. There are great players, great athletes who fear losing. Their identity is wrapped up in succeeding. Uh, but too much fear um, and expressed in the wrong moments, say in an interview, for instance, would concern me in that, yeah, they're lacking confidence. Uh, they're not going to surmount issues and they could literally freeze. Uh, nobody wants someone on the court who has to take the last shot in the basketball game, who doesn't want to step up in crunch time.
Oh, this is interesting because I saw some pictures where you had players in an article and it might have been a different one than the one you're talking about, but there were some players um, that you had given, looked at their facial expressions and then given a takeaway. And so it was obvious to see a winning facial expression and see what that looks like and a losing one, how that looks, you know, their eyes are down. But I never thought of using emotions like ones that we would consider to be negative as drivers for the people that you would have chosen. Like I never thought of it that way. Um, can you just explain that a little bit more to, how we can recognize that and use that in other places. Sure. Well, I, I would confess that I think the article in some ways came out too quickly uh, because I didn't have as much of a database at the time as I subsequently have. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, I've gone through and I've looked at NFL quarterbacks. Um, and that was, you're talking, it's the same article that you're talking about, the New York Times piece. So one of the people profiled there was Jay Cutler, who was then the starting quarterback for the Chicago Bears. And Jay had some pretty nice statistics. He could hang in there in the pocket and take getting battered, uh, but he never brought the Bears a championship, uh, not even really close. And there was eventually a kind of a building dissatisfaction with Jay that he just wasn't quite the guy. And I didn't think Jay was quite the guy. Uh, there just wasn't quite that confidence, that, that drive there. Um, he seemed a little too affable in some ways. I, I won't go as far as saying a feat, uh, but he just, he didn't strike me as the one who was going to lead the charge up San Juan Hill. What I learned from going more in depth past the time that the article was published is specifically in regards to NFL quarterbacks, because that's probably the marquee position overall, regardless of sports. And I say that in part because obviously the NFL has tremendous TV ratings. And then on that team, the quarterback gets, you know, the lion's share of the money and, and the glory or the blame if things go badly. So I took two games. I took a game where they were instrumental in the success of the team and a game where they were instrumental in the defeat of the team. And I took uniformly the first two minutes of the locker room debrief with the media after the game. Mm. So the great thing is these are all shot essentially similarly, regardless of team in terms of format. Uh, they were straight on close up, good lighting, uh, pretty standard questions. The media is not terribly original, you know, <laughs> How did you win today? You know, what went wrong? It's, it's pretty right. obvious questions. So quite standardized. And I just took the first two minutes when I thought they were the freshest, because quite honestly, the longer the interview goes, the more the quarterbacks and most athletes get kind of both bored and disgusted with getting <laughs> the same routine questions from the reporters. So their contempt for the media starts to win out the longer the interview goes. But taking those first two minutes, and I did this for all the stars in the NFL, and I did it over two seasons. And I came up with the emotional data. And then I used my stats guy who loves sports, by the way. And I said, look for the correlations. And we did come up with the correlation. And it's valuable, so I'm not going to offer it for free on the air here. But we did go through. We came up with a correlation. And then we did another correlation. We looked at their performance, because you can get an overall quarterback performance rating. And we looked at that compared to draft choice rankings. You know, were they taken first in the draft, mm -hmm. second in the draft? How did that work out vis-a-vis -vis their careers to date? We were light years ahead based on the correlation, light years ahead of where the general matter managers came out. Because sometimes you get the press clippings, the, the player has one great game, uh, you, think you, you really bonded in the interview, uh, you know, they come from the same part of the country you're from. There can be all sorts of biases and foibles that get you to say, that's my guy, right, and right. you can't talk me out of it. And it's going to be wonderful and we'll load them up with money and away we go. Right. And it just, you know, it so often doesn't work out. I mean, the most famous case is, of course, Tom Brady, who was taken relatively late in the draft. And of course, you know, I think everyone would agree he, he is the guy. He is the ultimate, the GOAT, the greatest player of all time for his position. Right. Well, I first heard of this idea of facial coding or reading the emotions through facial expressions through Dr. Ekman's work in the neuroscience class I'm taking. And then it came out in an interview with Dr. John Medina. He mentions theory of mind. Where are the origins of facial coding? Where does this all come from? 
Um, yeah, I'm sure we're all facial coders. There's lots of valuable information in the face. So I'm sure you can go all the way back to cavemen and cave women, and uh, arguably those who survived took in their environment, including the expressions of others. Uh, I have little doubt that that would be an adaptive advantage. And Charles Darwin, whom we'll come back to in a moment, would certainly agree. Uh, but I would actually probably start with Leonardo da Vinci. Most people don't know this, but both Michelangelo and da Vinci, who did not like each other, by the way, and were contemporaries in Florence, uh, got really interested in dissection because now we're talking about the Renaissance. We're talking about scientific inquiry. They started to explore the fascination with the body. They took very different routes, and you can see it in their artwork. What happened in Michelangelo's case? Well, he's perhaps most famous outside of, say, The Last Supper for David, the the sculpture David. And you can look at the muscles and how they ripple and how he handled it. His dissection was focused on the body and was quite in depth until essentially the Pope said, cut it out. You're making me uncomfortable. You know, we might start taking away your commissions if you keep this up. Da Vinci went the other route. He was most interested in the face. And you can see this from his notebooks. He is diagramming quite specifically what the facial muscles are, and he's speculating as to which emotions he believes they reflect. If you go to Mona Lisa, what do you get? You don't just get Mona Lisa's smile. Mona Lisa is also showing a smirk, which is contempt. She's also showing some anger and some sadness and a little bit of disgust. Uh, the reason why we talk about Mona Lisa's smile is because we know it's not just the smile. It's this ambiguous smile. And in fact, it brings another emotions. And I think da Vinci was very sophisticated in working on this painting, which consumed him for the entire back part of his career. He, when he went to Paris and became the court painter, he took one painting with him. That was Mona Lisa. So he left Florence uh, with a mule, walking his way basically to Paris. It was him, the mule, and Mona Lisa, those three together. And he kept tinkering with it ever since. That brings us eventually to two gentlemen, Duchenne, who was a French psychologist and someone interested in anatomy, and Darwin. And the two did correspond. I don't remember whether they ever met. I'm not sure they did, because um, Darwin, for one thing, had lots of health issues. And after his famous journey on the Beagle, I don't think he liked to travel a whole lot more other than to his garden and to the London Zoo to look at a, a uh, ape named Jenny. And one fine day, he came to realize that the facial expressions of Jenny looked an awful lot like his grandchildren. And it blew, it blew him away. <laughs> and that's why his last famous book was Facial Expressions in Man and Animals. And it's not the best written of books uh, compared to his book on natural selection. But it begins to speculate and go down this route. Uh, and essentially what Darwin said to himself, and I know this is a long answer, but essentially what he said to himself was, uh, emotions must give us an adaptive advantage. Otherwise, they would have been weaned out of us over the course of evolution. Where do we best show our emotions? He believed, and I think correctly, you show them in the face. For one thing, it's the only place in the body where the muscles attach right to the skin. So it gives you a quick, real-time reading of what's happening for somebody. So then we jump to Paul Ekman. We're talking about essentially about a century later. If I remember Paul's story correctly, he had a grant to go out and essentially prove that Ekman, that uh, Darwin rather was wrong, that there wasn't anything universal about expressions, uh, that Margaret Mead, you know, and it all being relative was was really the cat's pajama and the right person. And so uh, he accepted the grant basically on the idea that he'd go out and, and continue the path of kind of debunking Darwin on this on this uh, particular avenue. And he went on and he started doing the research and he went, no, actually, I think it's Margaret Mead who's wrong and it's Darwin who's right. And subsequently, we do have, in fact, uh, journal entries and stuff, whatever, whatever man manner they were able to gather them from the Polynesian Islanders who kind of were pulling a fast one on Margaret Mead and giving her the answers she was looking for and so forth. What I really like in a scientist is someone who goes out and just looks at the facts in front of them doesn't presuppose, goes where the data goes and figures it out accordingly. I had no theory as to what made a good quarterback emotionally. I just started doing the coding. Then you can get all the sports data. Then you look for the correlations and you go, oh, that's interesting. 
I like that route instead. So it's really Ekman who had the thoroughness because there are a lot of people who've looked at facial expressions. No one is as painstaking as Paul in, in doing this kind of work. He had a colleague at the School of Medicine in San Francisco, University of California, San Francisco, it took them, I don't know, it's probably about a dozen years in all <laughs> to do this cataloging. Um, but I, I think he got there. I think he's really the gold standard in this field. What's interesting, what I picked up that you, where you talk about the Mona Lisa picture, my neuroscience researcher has been saying for years to us in our course, he tells us, if you want to connect with someone on a brain level, you don't have to say anything, just stand there and give them that half smile. And that's the Mona Lisa smile. He would talk about it all the time. What emotion has that Mona Lisa smile? Why, why would he be saying that would connect with someone on the brain level, do you think? Well, if he only imagines there's a smile, then I would say that happiness and a smile is kind of nature's version of a open for business neon sign uh, in a retail store, mm -hmm. because it's inviting. You're suggesting you are open, you, you enjoy connecting with them, and so forth. Uh, if it works in Mona Lisa's case, I think because there's an element of mystery there. It's not just a gratuitous smile that we might see in a in a uh, press photograph, you know, a, a celebrity op moment. Mm -hmm. uh, we know we can sense that there's something more furtive, a little more complicated going on. And in fact, there was. She was the daughter, or not the daughter, the wife rather, of a very successful Florentine merchant. But Da Vinci was painstaking. It took him as long to do the original version of the painting as it took Michelangelo to paint the entire Sistine Chapel ceiling. Wow. So when she shows anger, I have to wonder if some of it is because he was such a, pardon my French, such a damn perfectionist <laughs> that he was driving her crazy mm -hmm. and she was getting annoyed. Right. You should also bear in mind that uh, he was almost certainly at least bisexual, if not gay. Maybe she had a sense of that. Uh, what we was known for for sure widely was that he was born illegitimate. So he didn't have good social standing for at least one, if not both of those reasons. So if there is some kind of uh, condescension going on, is it possibly because they have a different social station within the very close knit community of Florence? So that's kind of the undertow to the smile. So I, I, I like to think it's both those reasons in the case of Mona Lisa, the inviting smile and the recognition that uh, th this is a way with some undertow. Can you do a fake smile? Like, or can you tell when it's a fake smile? Well, this is a term where uh, Ekman honored Duchenne and the interaction of Duchenne. Now, Duchenne, quite honestly, did electric shock treatment to get reactions in his poor you know, patients or victims, as it were. <laughs> uh, I can say that Ekman did do this. Sometimes he he forced reactions. We so could see his own photograph and video, uh, but he chose to do it to himself. Uh, Duchenne did it to others. Nevertheless, um, Ekman honors Duchenne by calling a true smile a Duchenne smile. And what that's meant to signify is that not only did you get the smile around the mouth, which is more easily faked, you also get the twinkle in the eye, mm. that, that joy expression. Uh, yeah. because the muscle around the eye is relaxed and that's why you get that twinkle in the eye. Um, so that that's the Duchenne smile. Can people fake it? It's not just that you may not have that twinkle in the eye. Uh, it's also true that the, the rhythm of the smile may be off, uh, that it comes on too quickly, lingers too long, goes away too quickly. I call the smiles that go away too quickly a guillotine smile. Uh, the smiles that last too long in honor of Montana and the buttes there, I call one of those a butte smile, but B-U-T-T-E. And then you have the, the light bulb smiles that come on too quickly. One other thing you can look for is, of course, if there are negative emotions accompanying the smile. And finally, whether it's asymmetrical, because we tend to, if we're trying to pull a smile onto our face, we tend not to do it with the same symmetry or same degree of symmetry, at least, that is more likely in a natural smile. So there is no way to categorically know it's a fake smile. Uh, people can have complicated thoughts going on internally, uh, but there are some things that at least give you a, a hint that maybe indeed it's, it, it's a more forced, if not fake smile. 
And it's, it's not difficult to miss that sparkle in the eye that you see that lights up a person's face that that person is happy as pie, right? Um, yes. Although in market research, for instance, you are also subject to whatever conditions you are testing in. How close is the camera? I remember one study we were doing, and I don't remember which company it was, but I know it was a European company, and it was in London. And I thought, my God, is is, is this World War II again and the blitz is going on? Because everybody was sitting in the dark or semi-dark. And uh, in one of the truths of facial coding is that someone is more dark skin. Maybe they're from the Caribbean. Maybe they're from India, Pakistan. Uh, it's more difficult often to pick up the expression in a more darkly skinned person. Combine that with a darkly lit room, uh, it can get more difficult to pick up anything, including whether it's a true smile. Mm. Well, how did you discover this tool? And would you say that you have a particular aptitude for facial coding? How hard is it for the average person to learn this? Sure. Well, there, there's several questions in that. Let me try mm -hmm. to take them in, in sequence. Um, what happened for me is that I, I fell into this profession, which did indeed become my profession. I have a PhD in English. Oh, wow. So, uh, I, I was a poet. So I went from a verbal medium to a nonverbal medium, uh, in effect. And I switched academic genres or disciplines because, uh, you know, I never took a psychology class in, in college nor in grad school for that matter. But what happened was I was trying to ghostwrite a book for the president of a consulting firm. Uh, we were specialists in looking at the customer experience. And someone at IBM sent over an article from a now deceased Cornell University publication called American Demographics, talking about the breakthroughs in brain science and how much we are intuitive, sensory, emotional decision makers. And I remember to this day, picking up the article off the fax machine. You can tell it's a few days ago. I haven't taken anything off a fax machine in quite a while. Hey. And I started reading the article uh, and my hands started trembling. I mean, what you were talking about at that stage was breakthroughs in brain science, which were completely overturning, you know, Descartes, I think, therefore I am sort of model. Mm -hmm. And the whole rational lie that we have essentially in Western culture told ourselves for three centuries. And I knew, so on an intellectual level, I was simply utterly fascinated. And it happened to fit with some readings I was doing about Balbi and attachment theory and another book that I was reading about, you know, you know how the, the body chemicals can change our behavior, serotonin and all of those things that we may or may not be consciously aware of, but they definitely drive our behavior and reinforce it. So it just happened to come at a moment where I was particularly sensitive and interested in this topic. And again, my hands started trembling as I read the article. And by the time I finished reading it, I said, this is just the coolest thing in the world. And I don't know if I can make a living at this. I don't know how I'm going to do this, but I, I simply have to go in this field mm -hmm. uh, because the company I was at was supposed to be looking at the customer experience, which meant we were trying to be in some ways business scientists we weren't doing any research at all, essentially. Uh, we just weren't. But I wanted to do research. I'm interested in human nature and behavior, and I like to learn things. So um, so I, I left that company. I moved to San Diego. I put together a methodology that I thought was going to help me get at how people were feeling. And I sent it off to a, a wise and good friend of mine who said, it's great stuff, Dan. And I said, Joe, there's a, there's a button in your voice. I, I don't think you're quite on board with this. And he said, well, actually, you're right. <laughs> there's a fundamental flaw here. And I said, well, now I'm getting really nervous because I just spent half a year of my life devising this methodology, copiously reading all sorts of things to come up with something. And now I've got a fatal flaw. So I can't stand the suspense. You simply have to blurt out what is the problem. He said, oh, I can tell you the problem, Dan. The problem is people don't think their feelings, they feel them. And everything that you're proposing has a cognitive filter to it. So your premise is that at least 95% of our mental activity isn't fully conscious. That's what you've been reading. Your tools don't match up. You're going to have to start over. I don't have a solution for you, but you're going to have to start over. Yes. As you can imagine, that was not the, uh, the most fun conversation of my life. Uh, I got off the phone. I was basically shattered. 
Although I was grateful to my friend, in all honesty, for telling me his honest feedback. Most people won't do that for you. And I went for a long walk on the beach in San Diego. And about 11 o'clock at night, I said, the only thing left is the body. It's the only thing left. I've explored everything else. So the next day I got up and I drove up to UCSD, the University of California, San Diego Library. I went to the fifth floor. Uh, fortunately, at the time, I was dating a nurse who was working in the practice hospital at UCSD, which meant I had library privileges. And every day I checked out a stack of books. I got interlibrary loan requests and I would head to a cafe and I'm going broke in the process. I should mention because I don't have a lot of money at this point <laughs> in my life. And I am pawing through these books looking for what is going to be my tool. And one fine morning, I came across the fact that Darwin had come to realize in your face, you best reflect and communicate your emotions. And I went, oh, that's so cool. And it's tangible. And unlike brain scans, which is one of the other tools I was looking at, fMRI brain scans, I can actually do this because I don't own an fMRI machine. I can't afford to buy one. I'm not going to know how to code the, decode the data. And I'm not sure anybody entirely can, although they're getting better and better because I would go back to the poet Emily Dickinson, who said the brain is wider than the sky and the brain is very complicated. And I'm not saying the face is without its mysteries, but 44 muscle movements or 23 rather and 44 muscles compared to what? 10 billion neurons and always changing, always changing. I, I will I will take the face. Yeah. And then to finally answer the other part of your question. Yes, I thought I had an advantage. Uh, my mom loved art. She had taken me around to art museums when I was a boy, specifically in Europe, because when we were six, when I was six, rather, uh, we moved to Italy. My father worked for the 3M company. He was assigned to manage a film processing plant on the Italian Riviera. I know, tough break. Uh, so there I was suddenly in a culture where I did not know the language, was going into a city of 100,000, Savona, Italy, where Fiat sends its cars out of that port, going to Berlitz school unaccompanied on the coastal highway bus. So about 13 kilometers into a town of 100,000 to the Berlitz school where frankly, they didn't have another American, another English speaker student. And they just gave me a few lira and said, you know, the harbor's that way if you wanna go look at the boats. Wow. So uh, I was essentially on my own every day. And in, your, in a situation like that, you don't have the auditory channel, uh, you compensate as we all do in life. We know this from studies of people who've lost one, you know, of the five senses or other. Uh, the other senses actually grow and take over more territory within the brain. They become more robust. Mm -hmm. So in my case, I would say it's visual aided by my mom's orientation to visuals, having been an interior designer uh, briefly at one point in her career. And I do remember very distinctly as we left Europe, we stopped in Amsterdam and we went to the Rijksmuseum. And as a seven-year-old, I fell in love with Rembrandt. Uh, there's just the, 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 the sensitivity of the portraits, the expressions on their faces, uh, the somberness. Um, because living in Italy might sound glorious, but it's also true I was an outsider. Mm -hmm. It's further true that as we left to go back, before we got to Amsterdam, we stopped in Munich. And then we went and saw Dachau, the concentration camp. Uh, I had stopped in Amsterdam also to see the Anne Frank house. Um, you know, life was not, you know, and is not entirely rosy. And a lot of the portraits of Rembrandt, you know, have a piercing sensitivity to them and a complexity emotionally, as well as a real sense of drama in terms of how the personality is conveyed on the canvas. And so I think that was, that was my benefit. And I, I was eventually an art history minor. Uh, I'm also a left-hander, uh, and there are some studies who suggest that the people who are best at facial coding tend to be kind of in this rank order, women ahead of guys, wow. and either gay men or left-handers ahead of people who are right-handed uh, or straight because you're just a little bit outside the norm, and when you're a little bit outside the norm, and women should be inside the norm, they're 51% of the population, but unfortunately, we have a sexist culture still. And they're often not as much in power. And uh, you can tell I'm a former poet, because I'll, I'll, I'll cite something else, not just Emily Dickinson, but uh, Wallace Stevens, who has the opening stanza of a poem that goes, a duchess is not a duchess. 
a hundred yards from the carriage. Women understand this. And a lot of guys don't. To my surprise, guys are sometimes amazingly unaware of their context and their environment. So if women are indeed better facial coders, it would not surprise me. They might have a little bit more physical vulnerability, maybe a sense of social, political, economic vulnerability. And I think when you're a little more vulnerable, as I was in Italy, I think you're just a little more aware, maybe a lot more aware of what's going on around you. And one of the best ways to pick up information is the face. So that's an incredibly long answer, uh, but hopefully it was of some interest and at least got around to answering your three-part question. So this is good because you talked about your mom. And so let me just go back to the late 90s. My mom introduced me to theory of mind. And it was because there was a scenario in Toronto with these two murderers that it was a really bad, it was a murder rapist scenario. It was a horrible story. Anyone in Toronto in the late 90s would know what I'm talking about. Um, they were called the Barbie and Ken killers and or whatever it was Barbie and Ken because of how they looked. And I remember saying to my mom, you know, I don't see the murderer in this guy. And she said, you don't, you don't see it in his eyes. And she started to introduce me to what was called theory of mind, where she would take a picture or show me from a newspaper article, the eyes. And when you isolate the eyes, you can read and feel so much more than when you look at the whole face. And so she taught me that um, years ago. And would you say this is similar to theory of mind or reading the mind in someone's eyes, or is it different? Well, I'm going to start with the, the gruesome murders, because for a while, not only did I do the presidential debates and so forth, uh, I ended up on a few of the shows where you know, there was a trial going on mm -hmm. and there had been you know, a murder or more than one murders. And I stopped doing it after a bit because uh, one time I came off the set and my dad called me and said, you having any fun with this? And I said, not really, including because it shakes my sense of or my, my would be faith in human nature. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, you can quit, you know, and, and uh, so I did. <laughs> right. But I, I remember particularly in my case, not the Toronto cases, which happened before I got into this line of work, but there was a man named Jeffrey, I want to say Dahmer, but that's the famous murderer. There was a, a police guy in Chicago, and uh, he had gone through, I believe, three wives at that point all who died under mysterious circumstances. Right. And I was like, why would you, I mean, just from one look at the guy and a little bit of video, I was like, why would you possibly even spend three seconds in this guy's company? One of the things I tend to look for with someone like that is the inability to feel empathy. It was really odd in the interviews and the circumstances, even when it was more casual visual where he, video where he's not on the stand, for instance, where he just didn't emote very much. And yes, you could try to be poker faced and game face and sports and all those things and try to hold your emotions back. And, you know, guys are more famous probably for that than, than women, but you know, you should show something, you know, because you have what's called micro expressions to use Dr. Ekman's term, where even if it's not a really broad expression that others would pick up as a facial coder, you would see those little tremors and know something's going on. And he had a really flat affect a lot of the time. It's as if, because we emotions are contagious. We react to someone else. We, we have the interplay, hopefully the, the wonderful dance of you feel this and I relate to that. And, you know, isn't that neat tonight? A similar experience and all of that kind of builds and bubbles. This guy just didn't have it. And what he had instead was inappropriate smiles at the moment when something would be brought up to him you know, like on the stand uh, and he shouldn't have been smiling. Mm -hmm. It just was what, you know, we sometimes talk about being off message. It's what I would call being off emotion, mm -hmm. you know, not the right emotion to fit the situation, the context, uh, the topic of conversation. So that tends to be what I look for. So, you know, theory of mind is very interesting to me because I, you, you want to project, you want to understand what's going on for others. You know, you, you have to, on the other hand, and, and Dr. Eckman's very careful about this, you might know what they're feeling from facial coding, or to be even more precise, there are in these 23 expressions, about half of which go to a single emotion. But the other half go to two emotions or even three emotions, and in a few cases, even beyond that potentially. So you have to be careful to say what you really have. 
you know, how precise can you be? Um, and if you have more than one emotion, a blend, you know, what can that might possibly suggest to you? For instance, pride is arguably a combination of happiness. I succeeded and anger because I succeeded because I had the drive to control my destiny and get to the goal I wanted to get to. So what are the blends going on? So you can know arguably the emotion or be in the ballpark. And you can know what might be the implications for that emotion. Let's take sadness, for instance. So we will often feel sadness because we've lost hope uh, and we feel helpless and we feel forlorn or maybe in a commercial setting or in a sports setting, we feel disappointed. You know, my team lost. That was a terrible TV commercial. Is that the, the best you can possibly create? You know, it was awful. Um, so there are, you know, probably three or four impulses that can help to explain sadness. So what I think you can get to in terms of theory of the mind is you can start to narrow down the options and the possibilities, but you can't categorically rule any of them out <laughs> entirely unless you've got really good contextual data to go with it. You know, maybe what they're saying, some stimulus they just saw and responded to. So in terms of projecting what's going on for the person, I think you can step a lot closer, but being definitive, I think you have to be careful about that. I mean, Dr. Ekman would always say pretty much, we might know how you feel, but we don't know why you feel it. Mm -hmm. And so, and then I think what I would add to that is, uh, you know, Sherlock Holmes, you know, made fun of Watson and said, you have an instinctive grasp of the obvious. And what a lot of people do is they get taken by the words. And so they think, you know, this person says that and that's what they mean. And that's what's going to happen. I do like facial coding in that actions speak louder than words. And the movement on the face is action. And I do think it gets you closer. It just may not get you all the way home with complete certainty. Got it. Got it. And so what, how, how could we use this? Like if we're a teacher in the classroom, this is the focus of the podcast educators sure, trying sure. to use this as well as the workplace. And, and I do love the sports examples because uh, I'm so, I use sports for myself for health and well being, And so I see the, the connection between school sports and the workplace. So how would we use this if we were a teacher or in the workplace? Uh, sure. Well, first of all, you know, I came from a college town. I grew up in Northfield, Minnesota, which has Carleton College and St. Olaf College. And all my friends were faculty brats. So, uh, you know, besides my PhD and two master's degrees, I, I have been in the classroom as a student and as a teacher. Mm -hmm. And then in business, because I was very innovative, cutting edge in terms of introducing the importance of emotions in the workplace and in business, which really, frankly, in 1998 and onward, has been often very slow despite Daniel Goldman's work and others to fully embrace this because you just have some, some people who just don't want to go there, particularly guys. I, I think pretty much all women recognize mm. the importance of emotion, but there are guys who strangely, you know, they go crazy during a sports event, but then they want to otherwise claim they're rational and emotions don't affect them, which I find quite, you know, quite ironic. Um, so I have, in being an innovator, I've had to be an educator still. Yeah, you know, whether it's writing books, which I've written nine of. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Most recently, a book, a fun book called Blah, 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 a snarky guide to office lingo that's newly out. Uh, but in those books, in my speeches, in uh, presenting reports to clients, I always had to practice emotional literacy uh, and show it and demonstrate it and teach it to people. So I would say a couple of things in particular. One is confusion. And there is probably of all the expressions, because anger is a very common emotion and shows in many different ways, potentially on the face. Sometimes as the only emotion that makes sense based on the expression, sometimes where other emotions are likely involved. So one that is confusion and can also bring fear and sadness is where the eyebrows knit together and lower. So someone is kind of puzzling, thinking it through. It may be that they're actually not confused that they're just dwelling on something and really focusing on it. But if you see that in conjunction with fear, for instance, where the mouth might pull wide and kind of an egads expression, 
or the eyebrows not only knit together and lower, but also maybe alternatively at times, shoot upward and outward. Uh, that can really be a signal that they're struggling with something. And as a teacher, you, you don't want to leave them behind. I remember once many years ago, I was teaching at what's now uh, Missouri State University before I went back for my PhD. And I thought I'd given a particularly good lecture that day. But I had a student in the back of the class who pretty much always came late, never talked, uh, was a bit disruptive, uh, not the best student. But I didn't think he was, a, he was a dummy. I just thought he wasn't much interested in college. I gave this particularly good lecture one day on the way out. He, he passes his hand over the top of his head uh, twice, very emphatically to tell me that was over my head. And then he walks out the door. So in other words, I, I didn't connect with him. So, you know, having great content, a great lesson plan, uh, really working at it in the classroom. Uh, none of that means anything, unfortunately, unless you connect with them, whether they, they understand and they can follow the material. So I think that's really important. Uh, the second one I might go to is sadness. And in this case, I'm gonna draw an experience I had where I have no musical ability. Whatever ability I have as a facial coder is, uh, corresponds inversely to my you know, musical gifts, which is to say they don't exist. Um, I can't sing, I can't play any instrument, and I tried. Uh, in particular, I tried to take piano lessons. And finally, I, I did the new teacher because I was her first student ever. I did it in favor of dropping out because she was passing me in every single lesson. Uh -huh. No matter how poorly I played the piece, she would say something like, oh, that was pretty good. And then she would give me another one and another one. And of course, they were getting more complicated. And I was doing worse and worse. And I knew it. And she had to know it. So I, I mentioned that because sadness is a sense that you're you're lost, mm. you know, that you're, you're, you have, uh, you're abandoned, whether you're abandoned by, in this case, my lack of musical ability to take me down the path. You don't feel connected to the teacher because you don't think they help or care, or they're not noticing that you aren't on board, mm -hmm. uh, but you feel isolated, lonely, abandoned, without hope. And when that happens, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you tend to slow down mentally because you're trying to almost shield yourself. You're kind of like in a fetal crouch. You are a turtle that's going inside of its shell. And uh, like turtles, we don't move at that point. And um, so I, I think if you see that, you know, hang dog expression, you know, the corners of the mouth go down, for instance, you get a wince in the cheek. That person's in pain, actually. And I think your role as a teacher is to help, you know, join them there say, I feel pain actually, because I'm trying to be a good teacher and I'm not succeeding. And that's disappointing and distressing to me. And is there a way that together we can make this journey out of pain and get to some greater clarity and ability to you know, absorb uh, the lesson plan? And so those are the two emotions I'd really pay attention to, uh, the confusion and the sadness. That makes sense to me, especially as a former lifeguard, knowing how to scan a room and be able to pick up who's in distress, like whether they're swimming or in the classroom. What about in the workplace? Uh, well, the workplace is a, is a treacherous environment, uh, quite honestly, you know, office politics. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the, the positive reason why I started my company is I was fascinated by emotions. You know, the, the negative reason was I was sick to death of office politics and thought, well, at least if I start my own company, uh, maybe I'm not quite as subjected to it or quite as vulnerable to it. Um, so in office politics, as in marriage, I would say that the emotion you have to worry and wonder about is contempt mm -hmm. because that smirk is so important. It means you don't respect and you don't trust the other party. And as John Gottman's work at the Love Lab at the University of Washington, Seattle found out, contempt is the most reliable indicator that the marriage will fail. Wow. So it is not good for any relationship. Think about a presidential debate. What's the number one thing you want to do? Suggest that your opponent's a liar. Because then every time they say something, and every time they refute something you said, which may in fact be a lie, they have no credibility with the audience because you've already been able to dismiss them if you're successful in putting that stamp on them 
as the liar. So trust is the emotion of bankruptcy. It's the emotion of divorce. It's the emotion in the workplace of, you know, I don't believe my boss. I don't believe this is fair. This, this whole situation is toxic. It's beneath me. Uh, I can't wait to get out of it. And quite honestly, uh, retention rates for employees staying at places has been going down and rather severely. A lot of Gen Z and millennials uh, are perhaps, if anything, more emotionally alert, sensitive, literate, driven by wanting meaning in the workplace, yeah. wanting the company to have green policies and embrace diversity. And I think partly they've gone there maybe because it's just more in the culture. We have more channels. We have more diversity. We are demographically changing. And I also think it's because specific to work, uh, they know that job security doesn't exist anymore. The idea that you're going to get the 401k and the pension and you're going to be there for life and there's a bond. No, no. you're looking at the CEO who's making 600 times what you're making and you know, automation and other reasons could cause you to be out the door tomorrow. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you need something now <laughs> and you want belonging, connection, meaning, uh, you want a lot of other things because it may not be enough money to pay off your student debts and it may not be enough of a future there. And so, uh, you know, I think that that's, that's why that's such an important emotion in the workplace. Um, and sure, all the other ones matter. You'd like it to be more joyful. Uh, you might be angry and confused in the workplace. You certainly can feel isolated and sad. I would say that still pertains because every day, you know, in a job, you're, you're trying to learn, uh, you know, the hard skills, the soft skills, uh, how do you navigate the office politics, your boss's personality? I mean, you know, everyone should, in my mind, you know, take a psychology class minimum uh, because it, it pertains to everything. You're dealing with human nature, which is just as ferocious as nature itself. Oh, that's a really good way to kind of close this up. What would be some of your final thoughts for us to all take away? You've given some incredible examples for using facial coding in schools, sports, workplace. What should we all know about this? Well, actually, I'm going to go to a really profound level, which is because we've just been, and I'm going to date this a little bit, but, you know, the 9-11 anniversary. Uh, you know, I think it has to make us all think about what kind of leaders we have and what kind of situations we get into as a country. And the most powerful thing I just read in the New York Times the other day is we went to Afghanistan to bring them democracy. And instead, where we, where we sit 20 years later is the Taliban has just seized power. They're not going to give women, you know, an adequate role shake in things. And we are at risk of losing democracy at home. So I wrote a book not long ago called Two Cheers for Democracy, which I stole from E.M. Forster. And uh, it was looking at the emotional tendencies of leaders because our own emotions matter. Uh, heaven knows the emotions of the significant other in our life, boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, our parents, our children. Uh, those immensely matter, you know, for good or for bad, our boss's emotions matter. But the leaders, the leader of a company, the leader of a country, those really matter uh, because so many, the stakes are just so high, so many lives, so many things are, are involved here. And so in that book, I went through and I looked for what was the correlation? What did the presidential scholars do when they ranked the presidents? Who is most effective in office? Who is least effective in office? Then I went through all of our presidents because it's not an infinite set. It's like the NFL quarterbacks, you can do it. And it was a little bit difficult because you have different eras and different kinds of style of deportment. And, you know, you don't have photography once upon a time. You had portraits. So I had to do some, you know, intellectual jiggling where I had uh, three different kind of tranches and different uh, algorithms for each of these eras of being a president. But when it was all said and done, what turned out was that sadness was most indicative of a president who was not effective in office. And that makes some sense because it's a very high powered job and you need to churn ahead. And it's also a job where you need to rub, you know, the horse flesh. You need to interact with people. You need to cajole them into getting things done. If you are given to isolation, that's also not very good. 
just as it's not very good to be isolated by your own ego, because pretty much every president has somewhere between a healthy ego to a huge ego mm -hmm. to deal with. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also important because if you look at the presidents who have been impeached, then you're you're down to, you know, really on the precipice. You know, Clinton was a, a happy camper, uh, maybe too much so because happiness can get you into trouble because you get sloppy with the details. But if you look at Andrew Johnson and you look at Richard Nixon and you look at Donald Trump, and I'm trying to say this as a psychologist because I actually was a nonpartisan political columnist for Reuters on the 2016 presidential race. So I was an equal opportunity attacker of the candidates on both tickets. Everyone has their flaws. But I think as things have turned out, uh, I think we could see that, and there is a remarkable similarity in the emotional profile between Richard Nixon and Donald Trump in many ways. And they are both men who were really considered not to have close personal friends. They are very isolated in a lot of ways. Now, Nixon was much more bookish than Trump. Uh, there are differences there, I'm not pretending otherwise. Uh, but they really were given to sadness and they probably were, of all of our presidents, the two least given to democratic norms. And um, so that gives me pause for concern. And I would say particularly in the case of Trump, actually, because I also in the book looked at foreign leaders because Freedom House has gone through and they have correlations, they have data on whether this is a leader who allowed for freedom of assembly in an open country or is more dictatorial in nature. And what I found there was that the dictatorial leaders indexed really high on disgust and anger. And now you have Donald Trump because disgust, anger, and sadness are the three principal emotions for him. And he's very rarely given to happiness. And so that would be my parting thing. And I'm not, you know, I'm talking about the person. There are policies and there are parties. I'm trying to stick just with the person. But I can tell you from my data, and I've studied this in depth. I mean, I looked at basically all the significant world leaders from the time of Hitler to today, and even a few back into the 19th century. And the correlation was quite strong. And um, so that that's my concern for the country. And it doesn't matter whether it's Donald Trump running in 2024. It's anybody who comes down the, the pike because we have a very polarized country. We have a country that's very worried <laughs> uh, about its economic standing and the rise of China. We have racial animosity as well as diversity. Uh, there are a lot of things going on. And uh, I pray for a leader who has emotional intelligence and is, exhibits emotional stability and uh, would not be given to the trifecta I just mentioned, because it seems to make you not effective in office and more dictatorial. So one of my good friends is Doug Weed, and he's a presidential historian. And he often compares the current presidents to the past with traits. Did any show up with positive traits that you would consider to be an emotionally intelligent president? Just curious. Um, well, actually, in the front part of the book, it, it was hard for foreign leaders. I could not find anything in depth, although I, I know of Doug and his work. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, for the presidents, there was there was definitely good trait data available. And I use that in addition. And in fact, I looked for, and I've long been exploring correlation between emotions and traits. Uh, what I believe I recall is that, um, you know, emotional stability, which is the inverse of neuroticism from the big five tra traits, I actually thought would indicate someone was really in trouble uh, as a president. Um, and, you know, there were some wor worrisome signs there, particularly for some people. But you also had presidents, and I think LBJ, if I remember right, and I may be wrong, uh, was not emotionally stable. Uh, but arguably, Vietnam aside, he might have been a great president. Uh, Abraham Lincoln really struggled with depression, but he also had a sense of self-depreciating humor. Yeah. So he used his sadness. He was the, the great exception. 
ease his sadness effectively because it was counterbalanced with a degree of happiness that Nixon and Trump, for instance, simply never possessed, or in Trump's case, don't to this point. Um, openness to experience uh, is probably the one trait that most gets debated as to whether it qualifies and sometimes it gets redefined and whether it deserves to be one of the, the major traits. But it tends to have a real correlation less to emotions probably than to intellect, which would bring us to Jefferson, for one thing, who any historian would say scores really high and brings us to the famous comment by Kennedy, President Kennedy, who said that, uh, you know, uh, when he could assemble Nobel Prize winners, et cetera, in the White House, uh, that would exceed any other brain power gathered there except for those evenings on which Jefferson dined alone. And so Jefferson scored very high, according to the historians, on, on openness to experience. Uh, I believe that had some correlation because it means you're taking in data and you're looking at perspectives and you're trying to synthesize what's going on. So I, I don't remember the data offhand, uh, but if I was forced to guess blindly, I, I, would, I would lean that direction. So just to sum this all up, with this facial coding, you can recognize happiness, sadness, disgust, and these are traits that you can see in your sports players and our presidents. And just to sum it all up, they're not all negative traits, right? They could have like disgust and anger can drive someone to success. Is that what you would, how would we conclude here with what your facial coding has discovered? Um, no, I think that's an excellent point to make. I mean, I get really uh, annoyed when people talk about the positive emotions versus the negative emotions. Mm -hmm. It's true in business. You know, if you're getting to the close of your TV commercial and you flash your brand on screen <laughs> and people show contempt or sadness or anger, uh, that's probably a really bad thing. Right. So contextually, there are moments when, yes, you want happiness and you want to stay away from those. But as I always said, you know, there are other moments in a commercial where you want them to feel the problem because your solution's a lot more valuable if they feel the problem first. If your depiction of the problem hardly registers with them, has no emotional resonance, then your solution's just, the contrast isn't there. Um, and overall, yes, every emotion really has its upside and its downside. And you have to look at context. You have to look at the blend of the emotions and you want to look for the patterns. Um, but I would always come back to uh, a wonderful comment by George Orwell, who said, by the age of 50, a man has the face he deserves. We do have muscle memory. We do have patterns. Uh, you can look at people and you can pick things up. So, for instance, uh, I predicted the success of the Big Bang Theory for CBS. People were so emotionally engaged. I went, put all your money behind promoting that show. Forget the other four, which all failed miserably and quickly. Uh, we applied this to speed dating. And we looked at the couple's reactions, particularly the women's reactions to the guy. We were 100% accurate whether... Uh, she wanted a second conversation with the guy, 100%, because they had to, in the speed dating scenario, they had to say yes or no, whether they want a second conversation. Uh, I did something on the Mexican presidential race, and I looked at 100 voters, uh, one debate, 100 voters, uh, first room live, 25 of them, videotaped for the other three rooms, 25 each. Uh, the person who was second in charge of that major political party when I gave my results, said, you're wrong, Mr. Hill. Or maybe he called me Dr. Hill, so they do have a PhD. Mm -hmm. you're, you're wrong, Dr. Hill. You, you don't know the country. You don't know the language. You don't know the issues. And I said, yeah, but I, I know what I see on their faces. And my prediction was their guy would win, but his lead would shrink in half. And that the guy, that the woman that they were focusing their attack on was going to go nowhere and it was the socialist candidate who, by the way, is now the president of Mexico. He was going to be the one who surged. And that's when he told me I was dead wrong. And I was off by half a percentage point in the final results when the election was held a few weeks later. Half a percentage point. So I am not here to say I'm infallible. Human nature is too complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think facial coding is an incredible tool that can often get you a whole lot closer to what's going on, particularly 
in competition with what somebody says. Because if you have never been lied to in life, congratulations. You are either extremely lucky or you're not paying attention. You got it. This has been so informative, Dan. Thank you so much for your time, your research, your strategies for all of us to use and implement to become better at recognizing emotions in others and ourselves. And I know that American psychologist, Dr. Paul Ekman would agree with you that this is a skill we should all understand to use in our life. I wanna thank you so much for people who wanna learn more. Is the best place your website to find yeah. you? Uh, yes, and I have a fair amount of information there. I, I also do a podcast called Dan Hill's EQ Spotlight on the New Books Network. You'll find the episodes there and a whole lot of other things as well. So it's the obligatory three W's, of course, and then it's sensorylogic.com uh, because Sensory Logic, as in your five senses, is the name of my company. Love it. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Andrea.